I'm glad you're here today. I started the top of this week uh, asking several people to pray for me about today's topic. It was very challenging to me for a lot of reasons. I won't belabor the reasons. I was up last night at about midnight just praying over it. I got up early, early this morning, prayed over it again. I kind of came in on I-20 a little bit nervous just because I so want it to make sense. I want it to, I want it to touch you in a very special way. I don't want it just to be a sermon. Uh, I always try not to do that. I try not to just bring a sermon. I try to really think through it and bring something very meaningful. We're in a series called Supernatural Nonsense. It's a phrase that dropped in my heart about a month ago, a little over. And it's, it was based around a thought that was given to me, and it was this. I don't need church. I don't need some man standing up telling me what to do with my life, telling me what's right and what's wrong, making me feel guilty about the way I live, and then ask me for money. I don't want to do that. It's just religion. And so that thought and that phrase started rolling in my life because I thought, well, if he feels that way, there's probably a lot of people that feel like this thing called church is just religion. It's a preacher, a pastor, a priest. It's somebody that tells you how to live your life. And depending on what kind of church you're in, you can be very guilty if you don't live up to the rules of that denomination, the way they expect you to live. And it is true. In every religious gathering, there's always the live a certain way, live according to a principle, live according to a rule, uh, live some kind of DNA together, whether it's a church or a cult or a club, whatever. And the funny thing about it is I, I don't mind those kind of phrases and those kind of thinking because it challenges me to really look at what I do believe. I do think it's silly to think that way because we don't really think that way about anything else but church. Because if you say, I joined the gym, well, guess what? The gym has rules. The gym has coaches that will tell you how to live, and the gym takes your money every month. And we pack it out. I don't like church. I don't need some man telling me what to do. I don't like somebody in my face telling me what's right and wrong, and I don't want them taking my money. Yeah, but you get a life coach, and you'll pay a life coach to tell you you're fat and you need to lose weight, and you should stop eating bacon, and you should run more, and then we give them $50 a month and go, thank you, man, you really changed my life. So I don't, I, I mean, I do understand the religion, but I don't understand why... We act like church should be a place where we just let you live as sloppy as possible, expect nothing out of you, and then let you come in and use all the air, all the chairs, all the food, all of the amenities, all of the children, all of the nursery for free. And then we just go, have at it, do anything you want, live any way you want, because we just want you to love Jesus. When you think of it that way, it really doesn't make sense because there's nowhere else that does that. Your job has rules for you. Your, your school has rules for your children. Your sports teams have rules. And if you want to know how much rules matter, just watch a bunch of guys with a few beers in their belly watching football on Saturday. And just let them have a face mask that somebody missed and you will see a room that gets livid because you should keep the rules. So that started a thought to me of, is this that? Is this just rules? And is this just a building of religion? Or should it make sense? So I tagged the two phrases, supernatural, meaning I believe it is living, and nonsense, I think people do have a good argument. This is the thought, is that it, it is religion, there's no, there's no way around it. This is religion. It's the religion of Christianity. Uh, you know, and, and there's many religions out there, but for our sake, it's Christianity. And yet at the same time that, that we call this religion, 
It is, at the beginning of it, the wisdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean we haven't messed it up. But you can't just say this thing we call church is just religion because it began as the wisdom of God and we may have turned it into all of the stuff it is, but it still doesn't change God's mind. And so these things, I've listed six of them. I won't belabor it. I've talked about it every week, so I won't belabor the thought. But these are the typical things religious gatherings do. They sing, they, and that can be mantras, it can be chants, it can be hymns, it can be, uh, like we did today, choruses. Most religious groups pray. Most have a community, you know, whether they wear shirts together or they, you know, have the, have the bumper stickers on their car. And then they have teachings they follow. And I'm not saying they all do communion, but they have some way that they connect with it. And then all of them give, whether it's apportionments or dues or tithes or offerings or whatever. That fits the bill. And yet it fits the bill that if we're not careful, we will become religious and miss what God wants. And my heart is, I, I am for the people that debate this is meaningless. Why would, why would anybody want to come hear me talk about God when they can figure it out? I, I understand that. However, I don't want to just quit because I believe though people may not agree with it, it's still His wisdom. And I want to fight for his wisdom versus just throw it out and go, ah, let's just throw our hands up. There's, there's no real life in it. So here's what we're talking about. We're talking about teaching today. And this is what's been so difficult. How do you take something so practical like teaching and say that it's supernatural? And that's been my battle, and I hope I do a good job with it today to, to tell you why, and, and this is why I think it's strange, because I'm having now to talk about what I do. And I have a profound um, challenge each week to stand up here and bring something meaningful. I don't know how to explain it to you, but if you could just imagine, as soon as I say amen today and go to lunch, my mind is already starting. I've got to repeat this in seven days. But not only that, I have to stand back up in three days and teach something else. And not only do I have to bring something meaningful on Wednesday to a class and bring something meaningful on Sunday to you, I also have the challenge of I'm a father, a husband, a friend. I have hobbies. I have things that I enjoy doing. And so it is challenging. It's challenging for 33 years I've done this. It's challenging every week to, to find something fresh, and I do try to do that. I, I try to never re-preach something uh, at least the same way. I, I want it fresh off the griddle. I, I want it to come straight from the heart of the Father to all of us. And so when I had to put it together, I'm putting it together thinking, oh gosh, I'm talking about the thing that I do every week. And so that's why it's been a challenge of how do I do this that it's meaningful to you because I'll share my take on it. I, every week, close my eyes and say this. Heavenly Father, what do you want to say to that church this week? Now, I could pick my own topics. I could just say, well, let's talk about marriage. Let's talk about whatever. I could pick a subject. I've been doing it long enough. I could just pick a subject. But I try to hear what the Father God would want to say, and then I try to bring that in some way that makes sense. And I hope I do well at it. I, some days I think I do, and some days I wonder why I do it, and some days I think that's the dumbest sermon. Don't post that. So <laughs> I have my own quirks that I have to deal with, but at the end of the day, I, I go home on Sunday and lay down and think, all right, I, I did the best I could do today. And I really want you to know before we jump into it that I try to give it my best. I don't want to bring you something that I got from somebody else, from somewhere else, from somebody else's sermon. I want to sit down with God as a shepherd and think, what can I say to us that will help us know God better? 
Well, this is what it says. As the Scriptures say, this has been our text, 1 Corinthians 1, as the Scriptures say, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligent of the intelligent. So where does that leave? And this is what I mean by teaching. Because if we're not careful, we can take that God wants us to be stupid. Because He said, so where does it leave philosophers? Those are the people that speak. You don't even know what they're saying. They're so smart. The scholars... Those are the people that I follow that at the end of listening to them, I just scratch my head and go, God, I'm dumb. I, Jesus, these people are so smart. And then the brilliant debaters, the people that can fight you tooth and toenail on what you believe. And when I started my journey with Jesus years ago, I was afraid of all three of these philosophers. I was afraid to talk about Buddhism and Taoism and Marxism and communism and the isms and the Hinduisms and the all the isms and religions because I, I didn't know that I really knew what I believed to sit down with a PhD in philosophy and talk to them in a way that would make sense because I had no clue. And the scholars talked so far over my head when I went to seminary and I sat down in graduate school in my first class and the professor walked in and uh, when, he, when he walked in, he said, all right, today... We're going to be studying about, and he gave the word, ethnocentrism. And I was like, oh, I've got a, a redneck? I've never heard that word in my life. I'm from South Georgia. Ethnocentrism. I had no Google. I would have Googled it today. Just, hey, Siri, what is ethnocentrism? So I have to go home. I just, I just played dumb. He taught the entire class on ethnocentrism. And I'm just clueless. I just think I have no idea. I'm never going to graduate. He's just so brilliant. And then the brilliant debaters, they were the people that would say things like there is no God. There is no hell. There is no heaven. If there's a God, why does he let people suffer? If there's a God, why does he let babies die? If he's a God, why did he let my mother die of cancer? If he's God, why did he let me get abused? This Monday, I sat with a young man. God put him on my heart, and I reached out to them. And he sent me a long text back. And he said, I need you to pray for me. I'm not doing well. And we chatted around it a little bit. And I said, well, how about I meet you, and I'll come meet you. And he lives in another city. And I said, I'll just drive over in the evening, and we'll meet. And so I drove over in the evening. And we immediately started talking because I came to just, I felt inspired that I was supposed to talk with him. And I love what he said. I mean, I love what he said because it was a challenge because he sat down and he said, I'm just mad at God. And I said, well, why are you mad at God? He said, I'm mad at God because when I was a kid, I was molested and abused and I would beg God and beg God and beg God to please make it stop. I would beg God that my abusers would quit. And he said, they never quit. They abused me my whole life. He said, I understand, Mark, how you say Jesus is always with us, but I don't know that. I, I can't say that because when I was being abused, he wasn't with me. And so you can see that there are people in this world that, that can debate. And if you would have taken me back to my 20s, I would have just said, bro, I don't know. But because I've, I've tried to study and learn and learn God and learn His wisdom, I was able to sit and offer wisdom that He texted me the next morning and said exactly what you said shifted the way I think and my life feels better already. So that we can, we can understand that there are these things going on and we Christians can't ignore them. But I'll tell you what I think the problem is it's very difficult for people who believe in Jesus to go into the world full of philosophers, scholars, and debaters and feel like you can fight the fight with them. Because we just go, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to live life. I don't know. And I do understand that, but there has to be a place where we all come and go, well, you should know. If this is what we say we believe, if we say we believe in a heaven and a hell and a God that's real that lives in us, and if we sing the song, He's good, and if we say God is good and then tag all the time, then when somebody says, well, I got molested as a kid, He wasn't good all the time, you need to have an answer beyond, well, it's a good song. 
You need to be able to offer something. And yet, because what I've learned in my study is that the average Christian, this is not my stat, this is just across the board statistic, the average Christian has an elementary school level knowledge of Jesus. Most can't even tell you the books of the Bible, who the prophets were, just that simple. And so we, will, we would say this about Christianity. I think it's a top religion. I think it is, of all the religions I've studied, it sits at the pinnacle of explaining life and God and eternity and all the things philosophically. It explains it well. But to me, it is one of the most weak, anemic of all of them because most of the followers have no clue how to defend what they believe. We're just, we're just doing good to read the Bible once a week and to feel good that I did a devotion, but I can't even explain that. And so in this, there comes something that we have to say, well, then what are we going to do? And that's where I come in or whoever stands in this stage is that I feel I have a burden to help explain, which is strange. That's why I said I've wrestled with it. To help explain God in the way that I have learned of Him over all of my years living with Him to present it to you. That's why when I stand up here, I try to be very transparent to say I do struggle too trying to figure Him out trying to understand why he does this, but not this. I don't get it. I don't understand why uh, one person came up to me last week and said, I took you at your, what you said about giving a seed, and I gave a seed bigger than I could afford, a $500 seed. It was more than me and my wife had. And two days later, we got $5,500 back. We weren't even expecting. And I'm like, yeah, that's God. But at the same time, there's that. I ask over here, well, what about the family that's praying for their kid to get healed, but their kid doesn't get healed? Like, ugh. And so it just becomes, if we're not careful, we, it's so deep that we just don't want to deal with it, and we become very shallow. And when you're shallow, when you are shallow in your faith, it's a hellhole. Because you will be taken out. Because life is too difficult for shallow people to stay in the game long term. Because you're going to hit diseases and hurts and disappointments and disillusionments and people will hurt your feelings. And, and if you don't have a strong faith, you will always find a reason to tap out. I just know, I've been around in it long enough to know, if your faith is not strong enough, you will always have a reason to tap out. Because the reasons will feel more valuable than your faith. Well, I got hurt, I got offended, whatever it is. Just to show you what I mean by what I'm trying to bring, I will not belabor this at all, but I want you to understand where we are. There's a new thing called Pastor's AI. Pastor's AI is artificial intelligence for pastors, meaning I don't have to do a dad blame thing. <laughs> All I got to do, and I did it, is just say, hey, I need a sermon on, and, and, then, and it's just bam, there it is. So I took, just to show you how, where we are and what I'm trying to do, um, I, I went to Pastors AI and I took my Noah series. Everybody remember Noah? I took Noah off of YouTube and I imported it into Pastors AI, and I gave it a lot of things. I said, I would like a five-day devotional based on this. I would like a sermon series based on this video. I would like some Instagram reels based on this video. And I would like some quotes I could share on Twitter. Enter, and within 15 seconds, I had it all. So it, it gave me day one of my five-day, you know, what I wanted. It, it listened to my YouTube video in less than five seconds. It gave me day one, you're going to talk about the battle of righteousness. It pulled out quotes. It gave the timestamp in the video so you could go to the video and watch it. It gave extra Bible passages on its own that you could read in relationship to what I was talking about and then chose a reflection question based off of that that you could talk about. And it did it in less than 15 seconds. And then it gave me day two. 
Do you understand where we are in knowledge today? It would have taken me weeks to sit and listen to that and then type and then think of a question and then some extra verses. So I will say this, if you're a follower of Jesus today and you're dumb, it's your fault. It ain't nobody else's fault, not a preacher's fault, nobody's fault, not Stephen Furtick's fault, it's not Andy Stanley's fault, it's not Louis Giglio, it's not Pastor Dave's fault, it's not Crossroads' fault, it's not my fault. If you're dumb, it's your fault. Because there is enough information out there. I wrote this, the world is filled with brilliant, philosophical, scholarly people with enough wisdom to keep you learning until the day you die. So if you have weak faith, it's just because you chose to have it. It's, just, it's not because your preacher's not good enough. If you don't like him, there's tons and tons of teaching out there. So you can see the challenge to stand up here and feel like I need to bring something meaningful. And I will tell you this, I'm not against AI, all for it. But I think I have something a little better than AI, and I think I hear his voice, and AI doesn't. I think it can give me some, some good wisdom. I don't mind the wisdom of artificial intelligence, but I want an intelligence that's alive and is it the creator of the world. And so I'm okay sitting down going, okay, heavenly intelligence of a creator, I need you to download a sermon before I go to pastor's AI. But if you ever wanted to pastor and wish you could, now you can. Dumb people can pastor. Just go here. You don't have to know a thing and just stand up and you'll be incredibly great. But the Bible says that God calls all the brilliant debates and philosophical ideologies foolish. How could he call it foolish? Because the, the thinking is it's foolish and we think that, that God affirms stupidity. Because again, like I say, Christians can't answer a lot of the questions being thrown at us. So therefore, Christians just look like we're very uneducated people. As it was said once before from a very famous person, Christianity is the religion for weak, sick people. Because those are the people that flock to Jesus are the weak and sickly people, not the educated people. I didn't agree with it, but that was his thinking. So I would like to talk to you about is teaching supernatural or not? Or do you just come to hear a sermon and go, good sermon preacher, and leave? Let's jump into a story. Now the story, I'll go back and give you the story. The story is this. It's John 5. It's Jesus. He is on the scene and he walks to the sheep gate to a pool called Bethesda. Or Bethsaida, he goes to Bula Bethesda and he stands there and there's a crippled guy, 38 years, and he says to the guy, hey, you want to walk? The guy says, yes, it's the Sabbath day. Pick up your mat and get out. Jesus heals him on the Sabbath day. Ticks a lot of religious people off. They weren't happy about the life he gave. They were ticked that he broke a rule. And the rule he broke was you cannot heal on the Sabbath. Now, it, it is a long chapter, but it's this discourse between ticked religious people because he didn't follow the rules and the one that wrote it himself. Having a conversation about a guy that got healed, but the healing broke a rule, and we step into the picture. Here's what, where we come, verse 37. And Jesus said, the father who sent me has testified about me to himself. You've never heard his voice or seen his face. And you do not have his message in your heart because you don't believe in me. The one who sent to you. Now here is, whew, this stings. You, talking about the religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me and yet you refuse to come and receive life. And in this one text, I, I guess I could just stop here. In this one text, we have the difference between religion and wisdom. 
Religion is, I, I read my Bible every day, I do my devotions every day, I can quote scriptures, I can, I can chant the chants, I can say the hallelujahs and the amen sisters and hallelujah brother and praise God. And my playlist is full of Christian music and I drink my coffee with God every morning and I have this nice time and I go to church and I give my money. But at the end of the day, you do all of that, but did it really point you to a deeper relationship outside of the scripture with a living being. Because there's a lot of people that know the Bible, but their life is no different. Churches are filled with people listening to sermons today whose marriages are on the rocks, who are addicted, who have sinful behaviors, and have been doing it for years and have never changed. Um, Sunday morning is filled with people who have racism and filled with people with anger and addictions and behaviors that are not godly because we're listening to scriptures, we're going through the rules, and yet we just never find the life. So the challenge for me, as, as I say to the gentleman that said about, I don't need a man giving me rules, I get it. But the goal is not rules. The goal is to teach in such a way that you find life. And that you can say, by listening to that teaching, I'm closer to what Jesus desires out of me. And this is what I want to talk about. There's a life in my head. It's called knowledge. Knowledge is good, but it doesn't set you free. It's good to know Bible verses. It's good to be able to say, oh yeah, well, the devil's defeated. Those are good things. But there's a bigger life, and it's the life that's in, in your heart, and it's His life. Scriptures, are, are they're only given to you so that you can know Him. Scripture is given to you to invite you into His wisdom of who He is. Scripture is not given to you just so you can throw it back at the devil and go, he's afraid of the Bible. He's not afraid of the Bible. He quoted it back to Jesus in an argument in the wilderness. Lucifer himself said, well, didn't Scripture say that he'll give his angels charge over you? And yet we think if I just wave the Bible around my house, the devil's going to go, ooh, the Bible. I better, you're right, I better get out of here. They've got a Bible. There's a lot of people that have Bibles in their home and their homes are a wreck. So let's just go gut level. The devil's not afraid of the Bible. The devil is not even afraid of you quoting Scripture to him. What he does not like is someone who knows who they are in Christ and understands the authority that they have been given in his name. And the reason I know I've been given authority in His name is I read the Scriptures. And the Scriptures move me to a place that I now have authority. And the moment I take authority, that is what Lucifer understands. So there is this dilemma, and I will say that the top line is religion. It's you have it in the head. You have this Christian t-shirt. You have the bumper stickers. You only watch clean movies. You, you, you do all the right things, but there's no life in the heart. Paul will say this to Timothy. Now the Holy Spirit tells us that in the last days some will turn away from the true faith. And here's what's interesting. They'll follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Just so you understand, when we talk teaching, we're not just talking about philosophers and scholars and that you need to understand in the spirit world, there's demonic things being downloaded into the minds of humans to teach you. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to pull you away from a true faith. It goes on to say this, these people are hypocrites and liars. And I love this, their consciences are dead. So if we're not careful, we live in a system that is filled with dead conscious people, but the things they're, they're filled with, is, it's a, don't, don't let them capture you with empty philosophies, Colossians 2, a high sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world 
rather than Christ because all of their rules may seem wise and they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe body discipline, but they provide no help in conquering evil desires. That is religion in a nutshell. It seems wise. There's a lot of rules. Strong devotion. Oh, have you ever done a 40-day fast? Oh, oh, have you ever just done a three-day fast? Pious self-denial. Oh, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't cuss, I don't chew. I do not hang around those that do. Severe body discipline. Causing yourself to suffer because you're trying to get rid of the evil and the behavior. So I'm just going to, I'm going to give up Diet Coke. I'm going to give up donuts. I'm just, I can do this. I know I can do it. I'm doing it for God. I'm giving up donuts for Jesus. I, I just, and yet at the end of the day, it all seems wise. We all clap for each other. We clap for our strong devotion. Oh my, you've read your Bible for 33 years. Oh man, I'm so proud of you. Oh, and at the end it says, yeah, but it's not even helping you to overcome the evil. And I would just ask yourself, how long have you been walking with God? And when you answer that, ask yourself, are you still struggling with evil desires? Is the hurt still there? The anger still there? The disappointment still there? Are you still a husband that's a jerk? Are you still addicted to porn? Are you still flirting with your secretary? Are you still looking at women the wrong way? Are you still angry at people that have done you wrong? Are you still bitter? Because you know all the rules and you come to church and you listen, but at the end of the day, is anybody even being helped? Because that's the goal. The goal is that we should come to a place to go, these demons that have plagued me my whole life, plague me no more. Why? Because I have come into relationship with something that's bigger than them. I know who I am. Bigger than, well, how did you know? Because I saw it in Scripture and I was taught the way it should be and I decided to believe it. And so I would challenge you that this is a legit problem is that we do the devotion, we get up, we go to church, but the marriage is, again, the marriage is no better. We do the strong devotions. I'm going to do 75 hard, man. I'm going to get up every day and spend with God, but at the end of 75 hard, the evil desires never left. You just had rules that made you feel better. But Paul says this to answer it. He said, well, I really tell you what it is. You've got to put on a new nature. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Putting on the new nature is what we would call you need to be born again. But it doesn't stop there because he says you need to be renewed as you learn to know your Creator. Like the way he intimates is that the born again is the Creator moves in you and then the rest of your life is trying to learn Him. And what we do with Jesus is we bring Him in our life and rather than learning Him, we want Him to affirm us. I want Him to know me, all of my needs, all of my weaknesses. I want Him to know when my bills are due. I want Him to know what's wrong with my marriage. And the reason we we have such lackluster power is when I'm born again, the goal is to learn to know the Creator and to become like Him. So my whole life, you say, when does this end? Never. You will never arrive. The moment you think you've arrived, people need to quit hanging out with you. You you will not arrive. Now, I'll tell you for myself, that's comforting. Because as a shepherd, I want to set an example for you. I want to set an example of a godly man and a good husband. But, but at the same time, I try to present to you, my transparent, that I am a human. I can get my feelings hurt. I have some things that I have to work through myself. I'm not perfect, but I will tell you this about this old boy. I wake up every day and go, I want to become more like you. I'm not quite there yet. I don't plan on getting there anytime soon. But I am. Now watch. I don't become like him by giving a pity prayer. Oh, Jesus. I didn't wish you would help me. Be more like you. And he goes, okay, you want to be like me? You got to learn it, baby. 
And to learn, somebody's got to teach you. There's not many people that become masters on their own. They're usually an apprentice for a long time before they become the teacher. You have to learn about your Creator. So what I'm attempting to do is give you what I got saved when I was five, I'm 58. 53 years of me walking with God. How many of you know you can learn a lot in 53 years? When I was 25, I knew God. I had Him figured out, and I knew exactly what He would do. I'm 58. I ain't got a clue who He is. I'm like, oh, man. Right when I thought I had you figured out. And I think that the way we need to live is we just all need to be trying to know Him. And so I can become like Him. And that's the challenge of shepherding is the challenge to come up here and say, I want to help you know Him, therefore I'll share my struggles of how I've come to know Him so that you can, at least for a journey, follow along in my footprints because I'm trying to follow footprints. Paul says this, let the message about Christ fill your lives, teach and counsel each other, help each other get there. It's to fill your life up. And then he tells this to Timothy, but you got to remain faithful to what you've been taught. Because you know they're true. And you know you can trust those who taught you. And then he says what he's been taught. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures. You ready for this? This is kind of strange. He didn't even have a Bible. So when it says he was taught the Holy Scriptures, primarily the first five books of Genesis is what Timothy spent his life learning. But the first five books of Genesis brought him to a place that he could trust Jesus Christ. He didn't have the book of Ephesians. He didn't have the book of Revelation. He didn't have the gospel stories written for him. This brother trusted Jesus reading the first five books of the Bible. Why? Because every passage of Scripture should point you to the necessity of trusting Jesus Christ. I've said this on Wednesday. I'll say it here. The point of the Bible is not so you can teach stories of King David. The point of the Bible is so you read King David and go, that brother needed Jesus. It's not so you can talk about Samson cutting his hair. That boy needed Jesus. He was strong, needed Jesus. Daniel needed Jesus. The whole point of every story is no human, no matter how smart or how powerful they are, are ultimate failures. Therefore, we need Jesus. The wisest dude that ever lived, richer than anybody that's ever been rich, King Solomon, bro, had 700 plus women he shacked up with. Holy Lord God Almighty. One is plenty. Could you imagine 795? Pick your shoes up, pick it. Oh my God. The Bible says by the end of his life, the women turned him away from God. Why? Because even the wisest of us, if we don't continue to learn to trust, can be led astray. He goes on to say this, all Scripture is inspired by God. Now here's where it gets interesting. It's inspired by God to teach us what's true and to make us realize what's wrong. Oh gosh, here come the rules. I'll read it again. All Scripture is inspired by God. So when, when we go to our Bible. And we say, now this is the Bible. And somebody goes, it's just a book, book, book made by a bunch of men. Just a bunch of men wrote it. You can't trust it. I go, okay. I got that. But God doesn't have a problem using people. Could God have built a boat? But He didn't. He used Noah. Could God have built the temple? He didn't. He used Solomon. Could God have taken little Jesus out of dirt like Adam and made a little baby Jesus? Yep. But he didn't. He used a womb of Mary. Could God have come down with papyrus and wrote the entire Bible himself with his finger? Yep, but he didn't. He used their hands. So it says that all of this is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us. And here's what I endeavor to do. To teach you what's true. At least the way I see it. It's not like I'm out there reading David Koresh. I try to give you what's true. I try to give you what I've worked out, what has been true for centuries of Christianity. I'm not looking for something new. I'm looking for something true. Then it says, and to make us realize what's wrong. So if you come here and you hear this is wrong, 
and it hurts your feelings, good. It should. Because the Bible should challenge us with what's wrong in our life. I let it challenge me too. Like I need to get, I got to get a handle on this. But it also makes us realize when we need to be corrected and then it teaches us how to do what's right. So this thought that it's just religion and some man giving me rules, okay, if you shallow, yes. But if you understand the wisdom of God, God is having us learn Scripture so we can ultimately end up doing what is right in the trueness of faith. So what, what we have to do as we grow here is we can't change the message to be politically correct because we don't want to offend people because what I read here, sometimes it may because it'll tell us what's wrong. And here's, here's the real kicker. God uses it to prepare and equip His people. Not pastors use Scripture. God uses Scripture. Now, how does God use Scripture? Well, He wrote it for us. How does God use Scripture? He downloads it to a human. How does God use Scripture? He takes that flawed human and presents it to other humans. How does God use Scripture? That flawed Scripture coming from, I mean, that flawed uh, man giving out the Scripture of God or that woman giving out the Scripture of God, God uses that to cause life to come to you. Have you ever walked in the door and then all of a sudden went and go, Dear God, I don't know how a preacher knew that. Oh, oh, just right to my heart. Dear God, he must have been in my living room. He said the same things we just said on the way here. Well, what is that? It's not magic. It's God using a message to get it into your heart to go, that's exactly what I needed to hear. How did he know that? How did he? And the strangest thing about it is you could be having a sermon on tithing and somebody picks up, I need to quit committing adultery. Go figure. Because God understands how to take the Scripture and connect it right to your heart. Now, if we're not careful, and I'll end with this, if we're not careful, we'll come on Sunday and just hear a message. Well, oh, I hope Mark's preaching. I invited somebody today, God, if he ain't preaching. And then you invite somebody and go, we just got to be a little careful because it takes him a while to get wound up. But he'll, he'll be funny. You won't have a clue where he's going at first. But by the time it's over, you'll go, oh. And, and he's going to say boobies and stuff like that. Just know that. He's going to say things that his wife will roll her eyes at. But he's okay. Just hang with me a while. Like, right? Like, I understand that. But if we're not careful and you just come to hear me, you're in a weak place. Now, I don't mind God using me. So when you come in the door, or whoever's up here, when you come in the door, you have to come in the door with, God, whatever you want to use today, you just use it. I don't care if it's Michael singing. I don't care if it's Eliana singing. I don't care. You use whatever you got to use today in this meeting to equip me to be able to leave here stronger than when I came in, knowing a little bit more about you today. That is where religion gives over to his wisdom because I come in the door and realize, yes, it's just a sermon. Yes, it's just a human. Yes, it's just a song. But God is going to use this stuff to equip me to know Him better. Bow your heads, if you will. I will say, as a shepherd, every week I endeavor to bring life to you. Not just rules and Pentecostal isms. I want you to know Him. And every week we shall read Scripture. And every week we shall learn of Him. And every week to grow with Him. But what I need us to do as a church as we grow is that when we come in the door, we come in the door with, though it's just a human talking about some archaic book called the Bible, God is going to use this in a supernatural way to connect me to the life of Jesus. 
And when you're connected to the life of Jesus, it is for freedom that you are free. I ask you to ponder your heart today. Have you been living a lot of pious devotion? Saying all the right phrases? Doing the devotions? But still, deep down, there's these dead zones. There's these desires that just don't go away. You fight those demons all the time, over and over. Then I would challenge you, have you used Scripture to your religious advantage, or have you used Scripture that you might find His life? For Jesus said, they point to Me. They point to Me. Heavenly Father, I ask this morning that you take something that I have said and you prick a heart today. And you make us alive on this corner. And that when we show up every week, we show up with expectation that it's not just a sermon, a message from a preacher. But it's God using a human vessel to capture me, to bring me closer to Christ, to point out the areas of my life that need to be right, that I may learn of you, my Creator, that I might know you. Would you stand up with me, if you will? I put this on the TV. Supernatural teaching should move your life to a supernatural relationship with His wisdom and power. As we come to get ready for communion, the way we end is we end with communion and giving. I'd like you, if you don't mind, to take your seed out. What we, on our first meeting, we talked about the supernatural power of giving. Even if you give tomorrow or you gave already, you did it on your phone. Just take your phone out and hold it. Because I, I felt what I was to do at every communion is I was just to bless your seed. I was to bless your offering. Because it's supernatural. It's not just a dollar. Oh, in the natural it is, but, but once it goes from your hand by faith, what we learned on week one is it releases you to a supernatural intervention of God. And then, coming to the table for communion, what we learned is it brings you into a place of a supernatural covenant with God. So as you prepare your heart right now, I'm going to dismiss you to communion after a prayer. Robin will come at the end and dismiss us. But what I do ask is you bring your seed in faith. And that when you take that bread and you dip it into that wine, that you will see a supernatural covenant because what God wants is a relationship of supernatural wisdom with you. Father, I pray over the seeds today for every person that's giving. I bless their giving. I thank you that when they release it, supernatural intervention happens this week for their businesses, their life, their family. Show yourself strong. Father, as we take that bread that is broken and we dip it into that juice, I pray that every person will have a supernatural insight of their covenant with you. And at the moment they eat, sicknesses leave and peace comes and hope comes because we have a covenant with Jesus Christ. I ask as we take that bread that you... You do supernatural things around us in our homes, in our marriages, with our children because we're in a covenant with You. And I pray, Holy Spirit, take what I've taught today and let it sit into the hearts of every person that we may go out the door knowing You a little better. And I give You thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may come for giving and communion. Stay in an attitude of worship with Michael and the team. If you need prayer, our elders and myself are here to pray with you. We would love to do so. Bless you.